A yes, here the weather, may be your at Gavodiad are Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus questioned the sister of Lazarus. Do you believe this? I trust we all do this morning, this afternoon. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we gather here in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come into this chapel to worship you today. We bow our heads in your holy presence. You who are the living God, the true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of mercy and the God of all comfort. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will enable us to worship you, to give to you the honour which is due to your holy name. We pray, O Lord, that you will help us even though we are restricted in what we are able to do here today. We pray that you will enable us nevertheless uh, to uh, honour your name, to uh, give thanks for all your goodness and grace, and particularly concerning the life of our dear brother. And so we we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts and to help us, for we have no help but you. Hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, we can't sing out loud here today. It's a hymn that really should be sung very loudly, Uh, but we shall hear the piped version of it. And we certainly can, as the Apostle Paul says, make melody in our hearts to the Lord. All the hymns, as well as the main main reading, uh, as uh, they've all been chosen by Gwilym, So we have this first hymn. It's a translation of uh, Raglinyaith Vaur Anev by David Charles, translated by the late Edmund Owen, uh, one of the great friends of Gwilym. And so we, we sing in our hearts, Great Providence of Heaven. Thank you.
We now have uh, readings from the scriptures, first in the Old Testament, in Psalm 34, and then the New Testament in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. First, Psalm 34, 1 to 11. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Then Romans chapter 8, verse 18, and then verses 28 to 39. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God be praised for his word. Amen. Now, we are going to have a tribute from uh, Mr. Jeff Pugh, a son-in-law. It was a great privilege for me today to give this tribute 
to uh, William Roberts on behalf of the family and on behalf of Kaigurla Evangelical Church. We will remember him with thanksgiving for many different reasons. He was a much loved and respected church pastor and gospel preacher. He was a founding pastor of Kaigurla Evangelical Church where he ministered for 23 years until his retirement. He was a much loved husband and father, father-in-law, tied and great tied. Others have said of him that he was a dear friend, faithful, always keeping in touch and a blessing to be with in his company. He was admired for his witty sayings and his dry sense of humor. He was particularly admired for his amazing memory, how we could remember details from long ago and remember them right to the end of his life. But above all these things, he was a faithful servant of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he was diagnosed with cancer last year, age 92, he continued to preach and to speak at all people's homes and our monthly open door lunch and lead the prayer meeting for revival. He was committed to serving the Lord. There was no retirement for him. And he was an inspiration to all of us as a family and as a church. He was born on 7th of March, 1927 to William and Jenny Roberts. His father was a Latin teacher in the Arling County School in Mould. And William attended that school. He was the younger of two brothers, the other being Geraint. Besides doing well in his school exams, he took an interest in playing football and he was very enthusiastic like he was in everything that he did. One day he captained the second 11 in the morning and then played for the first 11 in the afternoon. Such was his uh, zeal. After getting married, his interest in sport continued and was passed on to the children. He took the boys to watch Wrexham trying to play football at the race course. And uh, often on family holidays, they were playing cricket together as a family. He enjoyed listening to the test matches on the radio and watching sport on the television. Uh, right to the end of his life, he was uh, enjoyed doing these things. Having been brought up to go to Welsh Presbyterian Chapel in Mould, he became a church member when he was 14, and he was also the secretary of the Sunday school. He said that because he was doing his best to live a good life, he thought he was a Christian, although he admitted that many things were wrong in his life. After finishing school, he was called up to the RAF for national service, and there he met two Christian servicemen, and Gwilym saw that they were different. They trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and it was Jesus that made them different. Despite this chapel membership and religious upbringing, Aguilim knew that he was not a real Christian. The following year, a Christian friend challenged him directly as to whether he knew he was a sinner and whether he had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. When Aguilim told him truthfully that he was a sinner, but they had not received Christ. The friend encouraged him to ask Jesus to be his Lord and Savior, and Guilim did as he suggested. He knew then that a change had taken place in his life and that he'd become a Christian. Originally, Guilim had planned to do a course in law, but now when he left the RAF, he knew God was calling him to be a preacher. His first opportunity to preach was being asked to take a service in Mould. After that, he got invited to take services in other places in the Mould area. Gwilym pursued an initial degree at Aberystwyth University, followed by a postgraduate degree in theology. When he was studying at the Theological College, he was used 
of the Lord in the conversion of a fellow ministerial candidate whose future ministry was greatly blessed by the Lord. William then worked for two years for the InterVarsity Fellowship, the IVF, which is today called UCCF, working among students in Wales. He was the first IVF traveling secretary for Wales, visiting Christian unions and universities and colleges. Gwilym met his future wife, Mabel, through the Christian Fellowship in Mould, and they were married at the end of 1954. They lived in a flat in Wrexham for six months. Mabel was working in a bank in Wrexham at the time. He was then called to be minister of two English Presbyterian churches in Tredegar in South Wales. Three children were born during that time, Gareth, Alan, and Gaynor, and he was there for three and a half years. Then he ministered at Hollywell for eight years, being the minister of two Presbyterian churches at Hollywell and Bagist. Two more children, Sean and Rhys, were born during that period. Gwilym and the family then came here to Caer in 1966. He was responsible for four Presbyterian churches, Caer Gurle, Summer Hill, South Sea, Pentre Broughton. Then a change of direction took place. He became troubled because of the doctrinal error coming into the Presbyterian denomination and its involvement with the ecumenical movement. Gwilym was an evangelical. That means he believed that all the Bible was the word of God and should be believed and preached and obeyed. And along with other evangelical ministers in Wales, he felt the Lord was leading him to resign and leave the denomination. Some members from each of the four churches also left, and together they formed the Kaigurla Evangelical Church. The first Sunday services were held on Easter Sunday, 1972. It was a difficult time for the family. They had to move out of the Presbyterian manse, but through the kind support of other Christians, William and Mabel were able to buy a house in Kyle In the course of time, the church adopted constitution and statement of faith, and the first official members were received, 25 in all. Some of these had been converted through William's preaching. In his preaching, William never wanted to draw attention to himself, but wanted to bring glory to God. He wanted to be faithful to God's word, not bring his own ideas. He didn't try to be popular or entertaining, but his aim was to point people to God's word. He always emphasized the sovereignty of God, particularly in the work of saving sinners. In their lives, both Gwilym and Mabel were shining examples to us of humility in the Christian life. Due to his spiritual wisdom and mind for detail, Gwilym was an excellent chairman of meetings, both here in his own church, but also elsewhere. The church became affiliated to the Evangelical Movement of Wales, EMW, and such was the respect shown to Gwilym that he was asked to be the chairman of the general committee of the EMW. He also had a lengthy series of articles written for the magazine entitled, Add to Your Faith. William is also the first chairman of the Council of the Evangelical Theological College of Wales, down in Bridgend. The college is now called Union. In 1988, the church agreed to join the Associating Evangelical Churches of Wales, AECW, which had newly been set up and Gwilym was appointed as the first chairman of the AECW. He had many opportunities to preach other than here at Caigurle. He was invited to preach at evangelical churches all over Wales. He also preached in many Welsh-speaking denominational chapels in the Wrexham and Mould areas. These were opportunities to preach the gospel where it was rarely heard and many have expressed their thankfulness for his ministry. He was asked one year to be the main speaker at the Welsh EMW conference at Aberystwyth, 
and he did a series of talks on the book of Zechariah. Earlier this year, a retired Welsh minister ringing up to, to sympathize said he remembered that series and it was greatly blessed to him. William was also a chaplain for many years on young people's camps run by the EMW at Bala. Well, he retired as a pastor here in 1995. He said on his retirement that he was thankful to God for his grace and his goodness to him and to his family over the years. He said that without God, they could do nothing. In times of difficulty, God was their refuge and strength. And God always kept his promises. Both he and Mabel stayed on as members at Caigodle. The next pastor here was Wynne Hughes. And uh, last night he sent a, a short tribute. And he asked if it could be read. And he said, uh, I'm sorry I can't be present today. Caigodle was my first church as pastor. Mr. Roberts was such an encouragement to me when I was pastor here. His kindness, patience, and faithfulness over many years was a powerful witness. May the Lord comfort you as a family and church in your loss. Well, despite retiring as a pastor, he continued to speak at all kinds of activities here in the church at Kaigurle. And he continued doing this until the lockdown due to COVID-19. Such was his commitment to serving the church and serving the Lord. In 2000, Mabel was finding climbing the stairs in their house too difficult. So William and Mabel moved to a bungalow, the other side of the village, a few doors from Sean and Jeff's house. In 2012, Mabel suffered a brain hemorrhage. She died peacefully a few days later, age 85, and went to be with her Lord. In his written personal testimony, William said, what the future holds, none of us knows. The Lord knows, and our trust is in him. We know that this life does not go on forever. The greatest comfort to those who trust Christ as Savior is that when this life comes to an end, we shall be with Christ, which is far better. Two years ago, William was interviewed by his grandson, Dan Pugh, and the video was put on YouTube on the internet. In it, William describes his childhood, his conversion, his call to the preaching ministry, and his views on the needs of the church today. His wonderful memories clearly seen in the details that he produced of events of long ago. Many have watched the video and been greatly helped. And uh, Dan is recording this service today and that also sometime will be on the YouTube for those who can't attend. In June last year, William was diagnosed as having angiosarcoma on the top of his head. This was a very aggressive form of cancer. And despite having an operation and further treatment at the Christie in Manchester, the cancer grew and spread down to his jaw. The CT scan showed there were some cancer nodules in his lungs. In June this year, he was advised that he had less than six months to live. During his last weeks, he was able to share his faith with those nurses and doctors who were caring for him explaining to them that he was a Christian, not afraid of death. Some of them have written to say that they saw his dignity and quiet acceptance in the face of death. They had noticed it. His daughter, Sean, had been looking after him since the original cancer diagnosis. And when she became unwell and had to go to hospital, William was moved to Nightingale House Hospice in Wrexham. He was well looked after, but became weaker. And with the cancer spreading, we were praying that he would not have to suffer much more. The morning of Saturday, the 27th of 
the 22nd of August, with this son Nalin at his bedside, Gwilym went peacefully to be with the Lord. We are thankful to God for Gwilym. We have many precious memories of him. Besides his five children, he leaves behind 11 grandchildren and 15 great-grandchildren. And Gwilym felt very blessed that all his children and grandchildren had come to know the Lord Jesus as their saviour. We are thankful to the many friends who have prayed for him and the family over the recent months. We are thankful to those who have sent their sympathies and their appreciation of Gwilym. However, we leave the, the last words of the tribute to Gwilym. He prepared some notes for his funeral and uh, in it he said, I did nothing to deserve God's blessings. I owe it all to my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died in my place at Calvary's cross. The praise and the glory are all his. Thank you. Well, we must pray. Let us all pray. O oh Lord, our God and Heavenly Father, you are the Eternal One, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And we bow before your holy presence and know that our only hope and our only confidence today is because of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the servant that you have taken to be with yourself. We thank you for what we have heard of his life and his ministry. We thank you, O oh Lord, that uh, you brought him to yourself. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you enabled him to fulfill the ministry to which he was called. We thank you, Lord, that he has fought a good fight and he's finished the course. We thank you, O oh Lord, for, for saving him and keeping him in the good way. We thank you for enabling him to be true to the gospel all his life. We thank you, Lord, that you've enabled him to be a faithful pastor to the people. We thank you, O oh Lord, that although many can't join with us here today, uh, many uh, do thank God for him all over Wales and beyond. We praise you today that some of us at least can gather here and acknowledge this before you this morning, this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, and Lord, we, uh, we, we pray that all who have been spoken to in this village and in other villages around and about here will uh, not forget his words of wisdom and truth. And we pray that youngsters who have grown up uh, in the Sunday school and uh, who have been to the church here will not forget the words he has spoken and uh, the life that he has lived before them. We thank you for this. And we pray now uh, for the family. We thank you, Lord, uh, for Gareth and, uh, and Alan and uh, Gaynor and Sean and, and Chris. And uh, we, we, we do pray that you'll be very near to them. Even though he's had a long life, 
it's still a loss. We still will miss, miss him. Lord, we, we pray that you will make up for this loss. May they know that he is safe with you in the arms of Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you will help them to continue in the faith. We thank you, Lord, for the grandchildren. We thank you, Lord, for hearing that they too have all acknowledged the Lord Jesus as their Saviour and Lord. And we pray that they will continue in the good way of their tide. We pray, Father, for the great-grandchildren. We've got many of those as well. And we pray that they too would grow up to know and love Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you then for this lovely opportunity just to remember and to give thanks. And we praise you above all for Jesus Christ, for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news. We wouldn't be here were it not for this great good news, this gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ. The gospel that makes us wise uh, about salvation. Gospel that uh, is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. Oh God, we pray that all of us here will know Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. Bless the preaching of your word today here. Grant that it may bring comfort and consolation, encouragement, and challenge to us all. We ask these mercies with the pardon of all our sins through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I, uh, there's a, another hymn coming up now, but uh, I must just say these few words. I hope you, you won't mind. Uh, but the church, first of all, I must say at Boris Park, where I worship, they send their condolences and uh, are remembering you uh, as a family at this sad time for you. They would have loved to have been here in considerable numbers. And uh, I expect so many other people from the neighborhood and uh, who remember Gwilym very much. The chapel would be overflowing, I'm sure with villagers and neighbors and friends from near and far. I think it would be true to say that uh, with the passing of William, uh, this is the end of an era as far as this part of Northeast Wales goes. And uh, in my life too, uh, I've known him for the best part of 60 years. Uh, he was the one appointed by the local presbytery to question me concerning my own call to the Christian ministry. And, uh, and that was in front of a, a large membership in, the, in Trinity Church at the bus station in Wrexham. And of course, he also represented the Presbyterian churches of Northeast Wales and Cheshire at the the induction service of my, at my first church in Newport in South Wales. So we go back quite a long way, over 50 years in that capacity. But uh, we praise God for him. Thanks be to God. Uh, now we have a second hymn at this point and uh, Caleb, one of uh, Gwilym's grandchildren has uh, put this on tape for us. And so we are to hear this. This is uh, this hymn, of course, De Magariad Velomoroid, a uh, famous Welsh hymn, been translated to English as Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. And uh, after the uh, hymn, our brother, Reverend Stuart Olliot, will. Uh, bring God's word to us. Uh, until recently, he was the acting pastor of this church.
He's not been too well recently, but we're glad that he's been able to come today. I was warned that he mightn't come, so I had to have a, have a message up my sleeve, but I'm very grateful he's here. So let's uh, hear Damagari at Velo Moro. family and friends. Can you hear me all right? Fine. It's a little odd behind this uh, visor. Your loss is massive. And we shall discover in a moment from God's word why it is so very great. It, it is massive. And yet we shall also see that your loss is no loss at all. It's very strange, a massive loss, which is no loss at all. But first of all, we must read, and I'm reading to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, and the first four verses. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You don't want a long sermon? You won't get one, but you will get three points. Now, dear friends, there is such a thing as the kingdom of heaven. That's where we start. As we go through the gospels, we find that there's one subject which our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaks about more than anything else. 
either by questions to him or by responses or plain teaching, 164 times our Lord preaches about the kingdom. There are three in those few verses that we read. It is our Lord Jesus Christ's favorite subject. But it's not a kingdom like we might think. In this not so united kingdom, how do we think? The Son of God said, my kingdom is not of this world. So there's no border, there's no place on the map, but he teaches us that there is nonetheless a kingdom. Where is it? And he answers that too. The kingdom of God, he said, because kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God is the same thing. The kingdom of God, he says, is within you. There are men and women, and I'm glad to say there are boys and girls as well, all over the world who are members of the kingdom, not because they live in a particular place or come from a particular background or language group or whatever, but because actually they are in body and in soul inhabited by the king himself, and they live under his government and protection. It's a spiritual kingdom, which is a matter of the soul, a matter of the heart, the matter of the real you. It's inward. And the day is coming, says our Lord Jesus Christ, when all the kingdoms of the world will disappear, every one of them, and all the rulers and dictators and governments will disappear, every one of them, and only one kingdom will be left, and in, that's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, of which the king is the king of kings and lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only permanent kingdom. It is eternal. So how do you get into it? I remember as a boy reading Mark's gospel and stopping in chapter 1. We read that John the Baptist goes to prison, and when John the Baptist has gone to prison, Jesus begins to preach. And this is what he said. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now your dad, granddad, great-granddad, friend, pastor, Gwilym Roberts would want me to ask you a question. Today, now, are you repenting? In other words, is sin hateful to you? Is what displeases God detestable to you? Do you want to finish with it? And are you believing, seeing that you're sinful and can't do anything about that and lost and can't save yourself? Are you looking away from yourself to the Savior who lived the life we could never live, who died the death we deserve to die, and who's risen again from the dead to be an ever-living Savior? So are you conscious of your sin and conscious, gladly conscious, ashamed, but gladly conscious that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners? Are you repenting? Are you believing? I don't ask what you've done in the past. I'm asking you what the Bible would ask you. Is that you now? Because on every bus you travel on and every church you sit in, and every family you've ever visited, there is an invisible line. And some people are on one side of the line, and some people are on the other side of the line, and nobody anywhere is on the line. There is such a thing as the kingdom of heaven. You're either in it or not yet in it. 
Now, the second thing I have to tell you, which you already know, there's such a thing as the kingdom of heaven. The second thing is, it is wonderful. It is wonderful to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Listen to these very strange words from the Savior's lips. I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And what do you make of that? Jesus is not talking about himself, but he says, as I look across the human race as the son of God, the greatest person who's ever lived is John the Baptist. But the least in the kingdom is greater than he is. But can you see the problem? If John the Baptist is the greatest, how can anybody be the greatest? Even the least can be the greatest. How can that be? Um, it's plain when we think about it. John the Baptist was the greatest human who's ever lived, apart from the Savior himself. He had enormous influence, faithfulness, privileges. But the least person in the kingdom of heaven has greater privileges than that last of the Old Testament prophets ever enjoyed. And your dad, granddad, friend, pastor, loved to preach about the benefits of the Christian life. You've heard from his lips justification, that we're right in God's sight. Adoption, that every true Christian is a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Sanctification, that the Holy Spirit actually lives in us and is changing us more and more into Christ, to be like Christ. Peace of conscience, we can wake up in the morning and not have our conscience shouting against us. Joy in the Holy Spirit. The Savior sends the Holy Spirit into us and gives us pleasure in the things of God, whatever our circumstances. You've heard him preach about these things. Perseverance, the fact that you're believing today and you were believing yesterday and today before, but you're still believing despite everything. It's, it's a privilege of the kingdom of God. And you'll continue to remain believing if you're truly a member of the kingdom until your very last moment, as he did. And then, when body goes into the grave and soul is already gone to Christ, that's a privilege, isn't it? There's no break of the fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And even the body belongs to Christ, has been redeemed by him, and will one day be resurrected. And when it is resurrected, Body and soul, every believer will perfectly enjoy God throughout all eternity. It's a wonderful thing to be a member of the kingdom. Now let's get a bit closer to our dear departed brother in the third point. There's such a thing as the kingdom of heaven. It's wonderful to be a citizen of this kingdom. Now, number three. Not everyone in this kingdom is of equal stature. Not everyone in the kingdom is of equal position, equal status, equal rank. All Christians, by God's great kindness, are wonderfully blessed for time and eternity. But Jesus says, that some people are least in the kingdom and some people are greatest in the kingdom. He says it quite early in his ministry. Just listen to this verse. Before I read it, let me remind myself and you that all of us are teaching something. We teach by the way we live, we teach by what we say, and we teach by what we don't say. Listen. 
Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So there are Christians who don't take God's word seriously enough and they show that by what they say and how they live. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Question. Did our departed brother teach the word of God and live it? Yes. And so we say, he was and he is great in the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this, we've already read it, but listen to this verse. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Would you describe Gwilym Roberts as a humble man? He was and he is great in the kingdom of heaven. How about this? He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be abased. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Did he think about going up? Or was he content to remain down? Did he sell himself? I would think in almost every preacher of the gospel, at some point or another, they give way to this temptation and somewhere along the line, they try and sell themselves to, to be better thought of, better spoken of. I don't know if I know any gospel minister except half a dozen, who I would say that was not even apparent, including myself. Did he think of himself? Did he sell himself? Did you ever see a sign in him that he looked for a reputation? We've heard about the influence he had, but was it because he was pushy? Or was it because he was a servant? There are countless other texts which go in the same sense and we haven't time to dwell on those, but there is a choice in life for the Christian. Shall I think mostly about myself or shall I think in terms of service? Self or service? Self or service? I'm quite sure that this dear brother of ours is now safely with Christ, woke up in the morning and thought of service. I'm convinced that he thought like this, which course of action would bring the Lord the most credit? He was and he is great in the kingdom of heaven. And you have had the privilege of having as your father or your father-in-law or your grandfather, you've had the privilege of having in your life for all your life up till a couple of weeks ago, someone who is numbered amongst the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There are very few people who've had that sort of privilege. We are at the funeral of a spiritual giant whose life and ministry were modeled on the greatest servant of all, which puts three responsibilities on you. 
The first is this. Thanksgiving. Would you like to take a moment today sometime, if you've not already done it, just to get alone with the Lord and to thank him for the life and ministry of a great man. The second responsibility put upon you is resolve. You've not only read it on the page, which you have, but you've seen it in a life that there is such a thing as spiritual greatness. The world talks of its celebrities, but it measures them in terms of wealth and fame and power and influence. But Jesus measures the citizens by their spirit of selfless service. Would you not on this day get alone with the Lord sometime and resolve in his presence that you will do everything you can to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, even at the expense of yourself, and you'll do everything you can to serve Christian and non-Christian as you've seen fleshed out in this godly life. And thirdly, thanksgiving, resolve, prayer. The greatest need of the Church of Jesus Christ in this 21st century is the need for men and women who are great in the kingdom of God. Would you not pray that the Lord will touch a life here and touch a life there and touch a life there that we may see many more such men and women as we've seen in Gwilym Roberts' life. Our closing hymn. I've found a friend, oh, such a friend. He loved me ere I knew him. He drew me with the cords of love, and thus he bound me to him. And round my heart still closely twine those ties which naught can sever. For I am his, and he is mine forever. And forever, that was Gwilym's testimony. I trust it's ours.
Amen. Let's pray. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>